the dark side of the looking glass, the corruption of our capital markets. This will move at a brisk college lecture pace. Take about an hour. Why should you give me an hour? Because our capital markets means your savings. The main event is to understand that rogue Wall Street firms are killing small American businesses for profit. I address that in the main presentation by first explaining the mechanics of stock trades and a loophole that exists in those, that system, how the loophole can be exploited, why the SEC is doing nothing, and I walk through a recent scandal that I believe ties these different elements together. There's a short postscript that gets more technical, goes into some of the legal aspects of what's going on, uh, a, a regulation called Regulation Show, how this can be understood in the context of public choice theory, and what can be done. How do stocks trade? Grandma on the left has savings, the fellow on the right has stock. Grandma's going to buy the stock, but her savings. The money in stock has to change hands. That's called settlement. In most countries, they change hands two or three days after the trade. That's called T plus two or T plus three. And importantly, the money and stock change hands simultaneously. In the US, however, while we operate on a T plus three system, the mechanisms for exchanging money and stock have become divorced, so it's possible for money to settle whether or not the stock settles. In reality, grandmas aren't calling strangers making stock deals. We have stock brokers. Stock brokers work in, uh, in places called broker dealers or BDs. Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, Bear Stearns, E-Trade, they're all BDs all represent them as blue circles. There are about 2,000 of them in this country arranged in a hub and spoke system around a central organization called the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, also called the DTCC. The DTCC acts as a central back office for Wall Street where three days after a trade, uh, when it's time for money and stock to settle, it settles at the DTCC. How does it settle? Trades can be settled through the DTCC. In reality, however, settlement usually occurs within the DTCC. Grandma is talking to her broker. The fellow on the right talked to his. These brokerage houses have accounts at the DTCC, and when their customers are trading out at the spokes, what really happens is the money and stock shift around within accounts at the DTCC. There is also something called X-clearing. That's when two broker-dealers settle directly with each other external to the DTCC. Two point five billion shares per day trade on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. These trades settle through the DTCC, within the DTCC, and back and forth directly among broker-dealers via X-clearing. Let's get back to our simplified system of grandma and a stock seller and see how the system handles delays. Suppose they do a trade when it's time to settle. Grandma's money settles through the system, but something comes up that blocks the fellow from settling his shares through the system. There could be all kinds of legitimate problems. He might be using paper stock and it's stuck in a bank vault, or it's at home lost in the closet or something. Maybe he signed the wrong piece of paper on some form. For one reason or another, he can't settle the trade, and you don't want the system to just grind to a halt. So the system creates an IOU. But note, it's not an IOU for money. It's an IOU for stock. It gets sent through the system. Grandma doesn't see that as anything other than normal stock. Her brokerage account says that she holds stock, not an IOU for stock. In most respects, the whole system just sees this as normal stock. It's only in the back offices that keep track of what's an IOU and what isn't. Assume that on day T plus four, T plus five, the blockage clears up, the fellow is able to send his stock through the system and he wipes out his IOU. Great. Imagine, however, that a guy shows up who wants to game the system, taking advantage of this loophole I just described. He's a villain or a miscreant. I paint his desk red to remind, to remind you he's a miscreant. He performs a trade with grandma. Three days later, her money comes through the system. But he says, you know what? Something's blocking me from sending my share. So he creates an IOU and sends it through the system. Does it again, and again, and again. But imagine he doesn't really have a blockage keeping him from settling his shares. In fact, maybe he doesn't have any stock. 
what he's doing is gaming the settlement system so that he ends up with grandma's money and all he's done is issue some stock IOUs to grandma. He's failed to deliver the stock that he sold. That's a strategic failure to deliver. It's strategic in the sense of deliberate. It's not an honest error. He just exploded a loophole. In 2006, people are saying naked short selling and they're saying fraudulent stock transfer. There are subtle differences, but the common denominator is that the IOUs are not sincere IOUs. They were strategically created. I'm going to mark them as FTDs for failure to deliver and paint them as red just to make them easier to track. How does this look at our hub and spoke system? Notice the miscreant on the right has the red desk. I'm going to paint the has BD red too to signify that the BD might be a crook like his client, or maybe the BD is the crook. Maybe the BD is honest, uh, but the, it's a broker who turns a blind eye to his miscreant client because the client is, say, a big hedge fund that gives him millions of dollars a month in commission. So uh, he starts trading with grandma. The FTDs flow through the DTCC and bounce around within the DTCC. Uh, if, say, for every 100 legitimate shares, there's one FTD, the system's going to keep on working. It's not going to grind to a halt. But if we ever reach the point where for every 100 legitimate shares, there's 50 or 100 or 200 of these FTDs, it'll become like sand in the economic in the bearings of the economic engine. Now look at the effect on a company. I'll show you basic supply and demand curves. Imagine there's a stock with a certain amount of demand out there, a certain amount of supply, and the point where they meet is $40. The miscreant shows up and starts gaming the system. He sends out FTDs. Since the system sees these FTDs as normal stock, he's increasing the supply of stock, of a parent stock. And when you increase supply, you shift the supply curve to the right. He does it again, generating FTDs, shifting the supply line to the right as he goes. Eventually, he shifts the supply line far to the right. Now notice where the supply and demand lines cross. Of course, the price collapses. The $40 stock turns into a penny stock. Most investors think penny stocks are the Wild West. They stay away, so demand dries up. As demand dries up, a ceiling forms over the stock. The FTDs in the upper right started off life as stock IOUs and sincere stock IOUs, but IOUs just the same. Now that it's a penny stock, these FTDs become penny IOUs. Penny stock, penny IOUs. The fellow at the right has the money, the firm's a penny stock. A vicious cycle ensues where the company collapses. Other businesses stay uh, away from the firm. They say, gee, it's a penny stock. Is it going to be around? They stop doing business. Capital markets shun the firm. If you're a penny stock, you can't go into the world and raise capital. So as it loses customers and can't access the market, it can't recover. Society loses the products and technologies that were offered. And because the companies that come under these kinds of attacks are often software and small pharmaceutical companies and high-tech companies, uh, because it's possible to create the most confusion about them. So when the next Microsoft or Genentech is destroyed, society loses those technologies. Shareholder value is wiped out. Jobs are destroyed, not just those today, but those that the company would have created over its life cycle had it not been strangled in its crib. And ironically, the miscreant keeps his cash and often does not even pay taxes for an arcane reason I won't go into here, but he generally gets away without paying taxes. The possibility that this has been going on has been kind of an urban myth for the last 10 years, but can it really occur? That question was taken up by a Fordham University economist named John Finnerty. Uh, he wrote a highly mathematical paper asking, given the way our regulations work, could this really happen? He says naked short selling, one of those terms I explained earlier. He says naked short selling can routinely occur within the securities clearing system in the U.S. with potentially severe market impact. In fact, it seems to be pervasive. It's a particularly effective and damaging a method and our systems actually conducive to this manipulative short selling. So his answer, can this really occur, is absolutely yes. Okay, can occur, but does it occur? That question was taken up by four economists from Wharton and the University of North Carolina. They wrote a cleverly titled paper, Failure is an Option. They discovered that in certain stocks, half the time this loophole is being used, it's being gamed strategically. Incidentally, the system has a a safeguard, a way to protect itself called a buy-in. 
uh, these economists looked at two years of trading data and discovered in 69,000 uh, cases of FTDs that the safeguard kicked in only 86 times. That's 0.1%, which means that in the other 99.9%, .9%, this safeguard did not kick in. So the answer is yes, this does really happen extensively. So now the question is, is it just happening randomly or is someone doing it deliberately? The SEC hired an economist named Leslie Bonney uh, from the University of New Mexico. She wrote strategic delivery failures in US equity markets. She takes a statistical approach saying that if these failures are just random, you know, folks who can't find their stock in their desk drawers, you're going to see these failures scattered randomly throughout the system. Uh, in fact, the distribution of FTD shows that market makers, which is an activity of broker dealers, do strategically fail to deliver. Again, it's pervasive, and the distribution confirms that it's more likely to be a result of strategic failures than just inadvertent or random error. So you can't see the bad guys, you can't get their names, but they leave statistical footprints. And Dr. Bonnie found those footprints in the trading records. So now the trillion dollar question is, is it happening enough to break the system? The answer to that is there are people who know, and they're at the SEC and the DTCC. They're fighting tooth and nail to avoid releasing the data. Uh, of course, they're denying that it's happening enough to break the system, but they're the same folks who not long ago were saying it's not happening at all. Or if it's happening, it's not pervasive, or okay, if it's happening and it's pervasive, it's random. Okay, so now they're saying okay, it's happening, it's pervasive, it's not random, but it's not happening enough to break the system. You know, trust us, we're from the government, we're, we're here to help you. But beyond that, they won't actually give out the data. A quick historical comment. Our founding fathers understood that public officials shielded from observation often form close circles of corruption. They understood that the free press has a special role as the immune system of the body politic. And that sunshine is the great disinfectant. In their spirit, this country in 1996 passed an aggressive government sunshine law called Freedom of Information Act, FOIA. FOIA is remarkable and it shifts the burdens of proof away from the citizen and onto the government, which wishes to keep a secret. In 2005, a gentleman in the Midwest began pinging the SEC with FOIA requests regarding levels of fails and aggregate by company. The SEC resisted, but FOIA makes it hard for them to do that forever. Eventually, they relented in July 2005, gave a partial answer. Before I show you their answer, I'll mention that I've asked Wall Street friends questions like, what percentage of trades fail, do you think? They give answers like 0.0001%. One said that in his 24 years, he'd never seen an FTD, that it just isn't really done. Highest estimate I heard was 0.01%. That's a hundredth of a percent. Since so about 2.5 million shares trade every day, uh, these estimates translate into a few tens of thousands of shares. The high estimate would have been about 250,000 shares. Here's the FOIA response. Note first that the SEC didn't bend over backwards with commentary and explanatory notes. So it goes. Here are two of the pages. Please look at the upper left-hand corner. It says aggregate fails to deliver by date, NICE, that's the New York Stock Exchange, and NASDAQ securities only. So this is not OTC, bulletin board, pink sheet stuff. This is national market stock stuff. The dates are April 04 to April 05. The numbers are 150 million, 170, even 230 million on the right-hand column, lower side. So on June 22nd, note there were 159 failures to deliver, and the next day there were 169 million. So they were saying the cumulative went up 10 million. So maybe there were 15 new million fails and 5 million past fails got cleaned up, or maybe there were 50 million new fails and 40 million got cleaned up. We don't know because the SEC gave a bare bones, minimally compliant response under FOIA. But judge not, lest you be judged. <laughs> I'm going to zoom in on a couple days. On April 17th, we went from a cumulative total of 153 to 230. That's an increase of almost 80 million shares. We had at least 80 million new fails to deliver that day. It could have been 90 million and they cleaned up 10. It could have been 120 and they cleaned up 40. But there was a net gain of 80 million FTDs. Uh, there were 2.6 billion trades that day on NICE and NASDAQ. So that's 80 million out of 2.6 billion. That's 3.2% of all shares traded that day failed. 
and the cumulative total that was left, 230 million, represented 8.8% of uh, that day's trading. That's outstanding. Now let me mention that this does not reflect another pernicious effect discussed in Leslie Bonney's paper. She calculates that the average persistency of these fails is 56 days. So these aren't rolling on and off. They get on and they stand for nearly three months, three trading months on average, and averages can be misleading. A brook can be an average of three feet deep, but you still drown in it because it's two feet in most places and 10 feet in one place. Similarly, on average, one of these FTDs is on the list for 56 days, but there are stocks whose failures to deliver persist for hundreds of days or even years. I'm going to zero in now on this letter's endnotes. Number one says the DTC data only includes securities that have FTDs of 10,000 or more. Number two says NICE and NASDAQ use daily data from the CRSP. That's the Center for Research of Securities Pricing. It's a, a database used by academics to study historical security prices. And words, words, words. The main event here is this response sources DTCC and CRSP. What's the dog that didn't bark? There's no mention here of information coming from broker-dealers. Thus, this does not include X-clearing information. That is that system of IOUs that runs directly among brokers. Please stick a pin in that thought, and we'll come back to it later. In March 2005, the general counsel of the DTCC, Larry Thompson, did an interview. But it was not what you or I might consider an interview. He talked with his in-house PR guy, for whom he presumably wrote the questions. Then Larry answered them, edited them, and published them on, his, on the DTC's own website. So he wasn't risking much. And there's little meat in the interview. But at one point, Thompson asked himself a question about the stock borrow program. And that is the DTC system for creating stock values. Larry says, just how big is the failure to deliver, and how much of those fails does the stock borrow program address? That is, so how big is the problem, and how much is the DTCCC able to address with their stock RUs? Larry answers himself, and I will zero in on his first sentence. He says, fails to deliver and receive are $6 billion. That's including new and age, and that's out of $400 billion in trades, or about 1.5% of the volume. He's saying, we do $400 billion trades a day. Six billion failed to deliver. That's only one and a half percent. That's not very much. Well, I wonder if a one and a half percent of the airplanes that took off didn't get where they were going, or if one and a half percent of our nation's blood supply had HIV, would that also seem like a small one and a half percent? Things got strange here. An economist named Dr. Robert Shapiro wrote a six-page response to the CEO of the DTCC. I'm going to conduct some textual exegesis for a few slides. It's a bit dense, but I hope you stick with me because it's instructive. Shapiro starts by noting, noting his background. He's a Harvard PhD economist, National Bureau of Economics Research, fellow of Brookings, Governor Clinton, Clinton's economic advisor, uh, Undersecretary of Commerce under Clinton, etc. So this guy isn't some lunatic who's putting tinfoil on his, in his hat. He's a heavyweight. Shapiro says, certain comments by Mr. Thompson were inaccurate and misleading, and I request you allow me to correct the record by publishing this response. Well, the DTCC didn't, so Shapiro went public with this. Now, that's a little strange. We don't generally have secretaries of, uh, undersecretaries of commerce using public letters to accuse officials of quasi-public institutions like the DTCC of lying. It's not the way business is done. So that should set off alarm bells. I'll take two paragraphs out of Shapiro's letter and walk through them carefully. Again, please bear with me. First, he, Shapiro notes that the $400 billion number is misleading because that's everything the DTCC processes, not just equities. Equities are stocks as opposed to bonds or other instruments, and the DTCC only does $82 billion of equities per day, not $400 billion. So Shapiro is saying, Larry, you said $6 billion stock fails is only one and a half percent of the 400 billion you process, but you only really process 82 billion of stock trades in a day. And if 6 billion out of 82 billion fail, that's 7.3 percent. In addition, he says, the DTCC reports on his website that 96 percent of settlements are done through a continuous net settlement system, 
Well, what is the continuous net settlement system? It's a system among brokers that says if Goldman owes Morgan 100,000 shares of some stock and Morgan owes Goldman 96,000 shares of the same stock, we'll just net them and say Goldman owes Morgan 4,000 shares. Well, if that takes care of 96% of the 400 billion, then there's only 16 billion that really needs to be settled every day. And 6 billion out of 16 billion is 37% of the total amount of stock that actually has to be settled each day. So if 7.3% was high, 37% is ridiculous. Shapiro then criticizes Thompson for minimizing the problem by suggesting that it stems from paper certificates and human error and such. You know, folks having trouble finding their shares, their dog ate their certificates, whatever. Shapiro notes that this can't account for the problem because, as the DTCC itself says, 97% of stock is electronic, not paper. Shapiro also refers to Bonnie's paper, pointing out that failures persist for 56 days on average, but sometimes months and years. Bonnie also argued not just that they persist, which they would not do if they were really just lost in a, somebody's desk drawer for a day, but that the failures are not spread smoothly like peanut butter across a slice of bread. They're concentrated in ways that can't be accounted for by random human error. They're pervasive, and if there were random human error, you could not account for the persistency, the concentration, or the volume. Thompson also says that the DTCC stock borrow program resolves 20% of the total problem. Well, I think that means that the stock borrow program does not resolve 80% of the problem. I'm not a Harvard economist, but I think my math's right on that. It means that in this system of 2.5 billion shares trading every day, the 20% of the fails are contained within the DTCC box as shown. What about the other 80%? It must be in the X clearing system that system outside the DTCC where broker-dealers settle directly with each other. The thing to know about that is the DTCC and SEC maintain that it is a private contractual matter among broker-dealers and not subject to SEC regulation or DTCC scrutiny. So this X-clearing system is more or less the Wild West, and that's where that 80% of the FTDs reside. So whatever the DTCC problem is, when one includes X clearing, the whole problem may be five times greater. Greater than what? One and a half percent, 7.3, percent And of course, it can't be five times 37%, because that would mean there are more failures than there is stock needing delivery. And I don't think that can be the case, but at this point, I'm not sure of much. The SEC FOIA response showed that at the end of every day, there are 150 to 200 million FTDs outstanding. That's looking like 6 or 7% of every day's volume. But remember, at the end of the SEC letter, I've said, look at the sources from this, the DTCC. I noticed that there was nothing in there about X clearing. Does the SEC or DTCC know what is going on in the X clearing system? They're not saying, but it's not clear how they really could. What they're reporting is pretty scary. And by Shapiro's deconstruction of Thompson, it seems that they may be underreporting by a factor of five. The right answer is the DTCC and SEC might be a bit more forthcoming, but getting information from them is like pulling teeth. The SEC is of late trying to be helpful, but the DTCC executives are refusing interviews and hiding under their desk. To go on from here, I must explain a term that's popped up a couple of times already, and that is short selling. I'll go back to grandma with her money and the guy on the right with a stock. I'll introduce a third player, a fellow, a citizen who has stock in a company. Let's assume it's non-controversial, vanilla, perfectly legitimate company, and that it's trading at $40 a share. Let's say the guy on the right thinks his stock's going to go down. He wants to bet against the company. That means he wants to short it. What does that mean? Suppose he creates an IOU for a share of stock. He borrows the citizen's stock and replaces it with an IOU. Then he sells the stock to grandma and gets her money. Cool. The fellow on the right is hoping that the stock goes down, say, to $30. At that point, he covers his short. That means he unwinds the short position by splitting his $40 into 30 and 10, goes into the market, buys the stock for 30. He, uh, he sends it 
that stock back to the citizen, wipes out his IOU, and he's left with a $10 profit. Imagine, however, that the stock goes up to 50. He wants to cover. He takes $10 from under his desk, combines it with the 40 that he's got. He's got 50. He goes into the market and buys the stock. Then gets the stock, sends it back to the citizen to wipe out his IOU. He's lost the $10 that he had to pony up from under his desk. So he's covered for a $10 loss. If this is new to you, think of short selling as like a mirror for your normal intuitions. Normally, if you own a stock, which is called being long a stock, when the stock goes up, you make money, and when the stock drops, you lose money. But if you're short a stock, then when the stock goes up, you lose money, and when the stock drops, you make money. How does shorting affect the market? The answer is it shouldn't. That is, the guy shows up and takes money while generating IOUs into the system. He's increasing the supply of a parent stock, and the supply line shifts to the right. The stock, if it's a big company, is not going to move much from one person shorting, but let's say it drops from 40 to 30. Then when he goes to cover his short, he buys in his IOU. He does it again and again, buying in these IOUs that he issued before. So that shrinks the supply of stock, and the stock goes back to 40. All his buying and selling hasn't changed anything. It just oiled the machine. He increased liquidity, economists say, and economists love liquidity. I'd like to walk you through that short sale mechanism again, drawing your attention to one detail that I glossed over. So I explained the first step was that the short seller borrows the stock from the citizen by swapping a stock IOU. And then the second step was selling to grandma. In truth, however, the system works differently. The way it actually works is first he does the trade with grandma and lets her money settle through the system. Then he borrows the stock certificate, delivers it to grandma. Everybody ends up with what they're supposed to. No blood, no foul. The problem is this is an invitation to our miscreant. As before, his desk is red. He says, I'll first do the trade with grandma and let her money come through the system. Now it's time to borrow the stock. He goes to swap and, oops, he says the citizen stock didn't come through the system. So he says, I'll just send grandma and a stock IOU. In fact, let's say he does that again and again and again. But maybe the citizen who was lending his stock doesn't really have anything blocking him from delivering the stock. In fact, maybe the guy doesn't really have any stock. In fact, maybe there isn't even really a citizen. Maybe this is just a villain building grandma out of her money while sending her stock IOUs. Does this resemble anything we've seen? This is precisely what we saw earlier. If you wondered how it could come about, I've just shown you the mechanism. He takes grandma's money and returns stock IOUs, but it isn't sincere. He didn't really need an extra day to find those shares in this drawer. He was purposefully, strategically generating failures to deliver, FTDs. I said that this was known by names like fraudulent stock transfer and naked short selling. You can see why. The villain has harnessed the apparatus of short selling, but he hasn't done the crucial thing required of short sellers, and that is to locate stock to borrow before he shorts. He didn't get a locate, so he's not limited by how much stock he can borrow. This should also resemble something else with a technical name. It's called counterfeiting. Why is it counterfeiting? Imagine that in this basement, this guy had a printing press running off phony stock certificates. If he took grandma's money and delivered her phony stock certificates, we'd understand that was wrong. So whether you call this naked short selling, fraudulent stock transfer, counterfeiting, the common denominator is that there are strategic failures to deliver. The guy is manipulating the rules to create the economic equivalent of a printing press so he can take grandma's money and send her IOUs for stock. He's failing to deliver what he promised. We learn in kindergarten that you don't do that, that when you sell something, you're supposed to deliver it. That's pretty simple. That is what is left outstanding 
150 million to 230 million times per day on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. No wonder the SEC fought for months against releasing this data. By the way, on the smaller exchanges, the other exchanges, the numbers are more like half a billion to a billion shares per day. Thompson tried to make light of it by saying, oh, it's just some inadvertent human error. Somebody didn't get the stock out of his sock drawer in time, and it's only 1.5%. But Leslie Bonney showed that the average length of these failures is 56 days. Some persist for months and years. Shapiro deconstructed Thompson's math to show that it's really between 7.3 and 37% of the equity the DTCC actually processes. And while it's not clear if the DTCC or SEC know how much of this is going on in the broker-dealer's Wild West X clearing system, Thompson suggests that it's four times the failures within the DTCC, so the whole problem may be five times the size of everything I've just discussed. But the answer is, who the hell knows? <laughs> Does this seem strange to anyone in this conversation? How big a problem is this? How much bigger is this than those early estimates? When I was a kid, I read in National Geographic about some South Sea Pacific Island where the natives had words for one, two, three, and many. Well, this is many times bigger than anybody expected. Is it 50 times bigger or a few hundred times bigger or a thousand times bigger than what anybody knew? I don't know. Who knows? But it's many. Okay, look at this in the context of the hub and spoke system. Could so many of these FTDs be accumulating in the system that they're just going to crack the system? In another part of that interview, Larry asked himself, if the volume in the stock bar program is so small, why are these companies suggesting it's a major issue? Larry answers himself, we believe that the allegations are just trying to mislead those who are not familiar with the program. Small companies, they're bad that their stock went down. They'll do anything they can to take people's uh, attention off their record. Then there's Annette Nazareth, who was the head of market regulation at the SEC and is now one of the five SEC commissioners. And in a New York Times interview, she said this is just noise being made by shareholders who are mad that their stocks went down. Anybody who's interested in this problem. So that's the party line. It's not happening enough to crack the system, and anyone who says otherwise is a malcontent. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along. Ms. Nazareth's quote mentioned a rule. What rule? The SEC issued a regulation called Regulation Show in the summer of 04, but it went into effect January 05. You see the name there in the left center of your screen. Regulation Show means short selling. It was passed due to public demand to tighten up these loopholes against the opposition of Annette Nazareth and the hedge funds. Reg Show was supposed to tighten this stuff up. It fails. I'll get into why it fails later. But in, my point here is that fake rule of law is worse than no law at all. And this is fake rule of law. In fact, the SEC put on their website some frequently asked questions for the citizen trying to understand Reg Show. And it contains two outrageous statements that demonstrate the SEC's weak commitment to transparency and rule of law. Understand that a lot of citizens are saying to the SEC, company by company, please tell us how many of these FTDs, how many phantom shares there are in the system. You know, transparency in markets is good, right? So in one place, the SEC website asks a citizen type question, can I obtain fails information? And the SEC answers no. A lawyer wrote it, so it takes a lot of words to say no, but it says no. And why not? Because the failed statistics of individual firms and customers is proprietary information and may reflect those firms' trading strategies. The release of this information could be used to engage in unlawful upward manipulation of the price of the securities in order to squeeze the firms improperly. Well, note that they left out one important word, and they left out the word illegal. They should have said that the failed statistics is proprietary information and may reflect the hedge fund's illegal trading strategies. The SEC does not feel it should give information to the public if it would reveal some hedge fund's proprietary illegal trading strategies. Hmm, that's odd. Reg Show has a second oddity worth mentioning. That is, it grandfathered the FTDs that existed as of January 2005. What's grandfathering? Suppose a town passes an ordinance that says, downtown, we're not going to have buildings over four stories tall. 
but some guy already has a five-story building. You don't want him to have to rip down the top story. So his building is grandfathered, which just means we're, that we're going to say that this new regulation does not apply to you if you're already outside it. Well, that makes a lot of sense. But strategically failing to deliver has been illegal since 1934. I don't know where a regulator gets the authority to grandfather something that's been illegal for 70 years. I don't think the law works that way. I think Congress passes laws and regulators are supposed to work within laws. I'm not a lawyer, but I recall that's the basic idea. Why'd they do that? Again, the SEC website reports, grandfathering provisions of Reg Show were adopted because the commission, that is the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, was concerned about creating volatility where there were large pre-existing open positions. In SEC speak, volatility has a special meaning. Uh, Enron is volatility. The market collapse of 1929 is volatility. The SEC's overriding concern is to prevent markets from becoming illiquid and blowing up. So decoded, this means that the grandfathering provisions were adopted because the SEC was afraid that if it forced people to make good on their large pre-existing IRUs, it would crater the system. So if the hedge funds generate so many FTDs that we're afraid the system may collapse, we'll grandfather that manipulation. But we're not going to tell you how much they've done it because that may reveal their illegal trading strategies, which are, after all, proprietary. So this is all roughly like a police chief addressing the problem of Central Park mugging by saying, trust us, there's not much mugging going on, but we're not going to say where it's occurring because that would reveal the proprietary strategies of the muggers and might enable someone to confront the muggers, which would be illegal. And we're not going to disclose precisely how much mugging is going on because we're afraid it might disrupt our economy if they stopped. I made a cartoon. Here's the SEC's blind justice. But the blind justice is speaking out of both sides of her mouth. Out of one side, she poo-poos it all, saying this is just shareholders mad their stock didn't go up, some people trying to mislead the public, trying to take people's attention off their records. Out of the other side, she's saying the grandfathering provisions of Reg Show were adopted because the SEC was concerned about creating volatility where there were large pre-existing open positions and that the failed statistics of individual firms is proprietary information. And we can't disclose that because it might make the firms that have been practicing the illegal trading strategies lose money, which would be unlawful. To paraphrase, she's saying, there are no large batches of IOUs in the system, and anyone who says otherwise is just a paranoid or a nut. Out of the other side of her mouth, she's saying, uh, those large batches of FTDs that don't exist, we have to grandfather them and can't disclose their size, otherwise the volatility would disrupt the capital markets and reveal the trading strategies of the criminals who've been doing it. Well, I promised you a trip down the rabbit hole. I think we're there. There's an SEC... Here's an example. iOmega was a company that quintupled in a three-month period back in the last decade. It wasn't that they got five times better in three months. It's widely believed that this was a short squeeze. Now consider a scarier question. What does the situation look like if there's not just shorting, but naked shorting? Remember our miscreant. Let's assume he generated millions of FTDs into the system. What does his squeeze look like? If shorting has gone on, this not just the normal borrowing and then shorting of stock, but naked shorting, been, been scattering these FTDs all over the system, and when the fellow goes to cover, there are more FTDs in the system than there is real stock to be bought. So as he tries to buy stock to deliver against his short, he gets in trouble. <clears throat> the supply and demand line shifts so far that they don't meet anymore. There is no market price. The market snaps. That's volatility. And that's what the SEC wants to avoid. Why? Remember that a lot of this money isn't in the system anymore because as the price went down, the miscreant was able to withdraw his money out of his short position. 
So that money's been turned into mansions and Ferraris and the Hamptons and in Greenwich, Connecticut. And in any case, perhaps enough FTDs have been issued that the squeeze would take the price far beyond where the price was when the shorting occurred, so that it will take more money to cover than was taken out of the short position. If this fellow is forced to cover, he'll use all his money covering a fraction of the failures. But he's going to run out of money before he runs out of value used to cover, so he's gone. The broker-dealer could be in the same situation. In fact, if a buy-in really occurs, the price could get high enough that there'd be more FTDs in the system than liquidity in the system, in which case you would see a wave of failures move through the system like this. I know that sounds crazy. Systemic failures like that don't happen, right? Well, they did with the SNLs 15 years ago, but this couldn't happen with Wall Street, right? I believe the SEC fears it might. I believe that is exactly what they're talking about here when they say that grandfathering was adopted because the SEC was concerned about creating volatility where there were large pre-existing open positions. They are right. If the large pre-existing open positions are large enough, the darn well can create volatility, and they should be worried about that. The SEC understands that if they force the miscreants to cover those 150 million FTDs in the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and the half billion to billion in the other exchanges, you can have exactly the situation I just depicted. And this isn't just me saying that. It's right there on the SEC website. Read it for yourself and see if you have any other interpretation of what's going on. That would also explain why they take this rather odd position saying that the fail statistics of the hedge funds is proprietary information and may reflect their illegal trading strategies. Releasing the information could be used to engage in unlawful upward manipulation of prices in order to squeeze the hedge funds properly. N note that in, in their worldview, information cannot be released to the public not only because it might reveal the illegal trading strategies, but because it might make the stocks go up unlawfully. You know, downward manipulation is also unlawful, incidentally, but that kind of manipulation can be ignored, grandfathered, not disclosed, shielded by toothless regulations, whatever. It's not that unlawful, but a rebound would be unlawful. Now, this is a beautiful window into the mentality of the SEC and, and Wall Street in general. Wall Street's making money, so God's in his heaven. When the rubes out in America who actually produce things and direct their savings to Wall Street see their savings get looted and replaced with IOUs. That's something that's got to be grandfathered. But the SEC cannot release information on the IOUs because that may, might make the stocks rebound, which would make the hedge funds lose money, which would be unlawful. You know, the rubes just don't understand that their place in the system is to surrender their savings to Wall Street. I'm going to conclude this presentation with one case study. To get there, I'm going to talk about Switzerland and Austria. Now, Hollywood always talks about Swiss banks as secret havens for criminals and money laundering and such. The truth is that era is over. Switzerland cleaned up its act 10 years ago, and the banking system there is transparent to the gaze of international law. Austria is a different story. There's a saying among historians that one of the ironies of history is that Hitler will be remembered as German and Beethoven as Austrian. You know, Austria, of course, the reverse is true. So Austria gets a break. It is just not widely known that Austria emerged in the late 1990s as a prominent center for money laundering. Here is a 1996 report from the Department of State on money laundering, ranking Austria medium high. It discusses Russian organized crime groups using Austrian accounts to launder money. They attribute the problem to anonymous securities accounts. Austria had at the time anonymous bank accounts and even anonymous security accounts. 95% of the savings of Austrians were in these passbook accounts. You were supposed to be Austrian in order to get the accounts, but the banks didn't require proof of being Austrian, so anyone who could speak a little German could open an account, deposit cash and stock, and then whoever had an account passbook could withdraw it. Think that created any opportunities for money laundering? <laughs> who knew? This article from The Telegraph 
a British newspaper, mentions that Austria tightened its banking laws after the U.S. named it as one of the money laundering capitals of the world because of these secretive bank accounts. They only recently froze them under international pressure. In fact, this article actually concerns North Koreans spying out of banks there using the North Korean bank's Austrian branch to camouflage raising money to fund weapons of mass destruction, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not trying to knock Austria. I don't want to get any letters from Austrians. I love the place. In my youth, I had an Austrian lady friend, and I lived there for six months. I loved it. My point is only that if your image of Austria is the sound of music, you're missing the fact that Austria is a pretty strange place. People don't understand how after the USSR self-destructed, Austria emerged as a kind of no man's land of international crime, especially Russian uh, organized crime. After 9-11, things tightened up a bit. It's a pretty strange place. It's a cool place, just a little strange. So let's put a pin in that and we'll come back to it. Sedona is a Pennsylvania company that makes customer service software for small and mid-sized companies, uh, CRM, which is like customer service on steroids. In 2000 and 2001, its stock price collapsed. It could have been that they didn't do well, that the market didn't like them, that they weren't a good company, etc. Could have been, but it wasn't. The SEC uncovered a massive manipulation in Sedona and ran like this. In 2001, there was a crooked hedge fund named Rhino Advisors, run by two guys, Tom and Andreas Badian. They were working on behalf of a client, uh, AMRO. AMRO is Panamanian or Swiss, depending on what you read. It's really a big Swiss financial conglomerate with roots in the, ne in the Netherlands, but this was a fund they maintained in Panama. On AMRO's behalf, Rhino told their broker-dealer to short Sedona mercilessly. That's actually on tape with a broker-dealer, a company called Revco Securities. Rhino did this as part of a death spiral convert, which was a popular financial trick a few years ago. Amro loaned money to Sedona, they loaned it with one hand, and then they took the money back with the other via this naked shorting technique. That's what a death spiral convert is. I won't go into it further other than to say it was a popular financial trick a few years ago. But now you should know what this looked like. They generated all these FTDs into the system. Do we know how many FTDs got generated? We don't because, as the SEC website says, they can't release that kind of information to the public. But we know there are 85 million shares in Sedona. It's widely thought that there are 100 to 700 million FTDs generated. In 2003, the SEC pursued a naked shorting civil action against Rhino, gave them a million dollar penalty. Rhino blew up. Tom Beatty and disappeared. The SEC gave the DOJ the tapes of Rhino talking to Revco brokers, giving instructions to short Sedona mercilessly. In October of 2003, Revco was subpoenaed, I think, by the Manhattan District Attorney. The investigation centered on Phil Bennett and Santo Maggio. Phil Bennett was the CEO, Santo Maggio the president. Santo's roots were in the stock loan business within Revco. Every broker-dealer has a stock loan desk, and the business of loaning stock, as I've indicated, is at the heart of the whole naked shorting system. Because, if you remember the explanation of shorting, someone has to borrow stock before it gets shorted, and so stock loan desk slippage is what permits naked shorting. So stock loan is the heart of the naked shorting system, and that's where Santo Maggio came from. 2005, what was the result? <coughs> It's pretty weird. In May, Revco revealed that they received an SEC Wells notice. A Wells notice is the SEC's way of saying, we're coming for you. Revco negotiated a fine. Maggio had a penalty of being relieved of administrative tasks for a year. Um, I wonder if I can negotiate that fine with someone. Can I be relieved of administrative tasks? Yeah. A couple funny things happened in August. First, Badian was found alive in Austria by lawyers working on another stock manipulation case. Second, the SEC did what any good regulator would do when faced with a crooked broker-dealer acting on behalf of criminal clients and stock manipulation schemes to destroy small American companies. Did what any good regular, you know, on-the-ball regulator would do, and that is they gave the green light for a Revco IPO. Now, remember that the P in IPO stands for public. 
its initial public offering. So the SEC said that it would be a fine and right thing for this fine company to take half a billion dollars of the public savings. In October, a Revco accountant, a new guy on the job, discovered a $430 million liability being kited on and off the balance sheet by a New, a new Jersey hedge fund called Liberty, which I'll note has denied any knowledge that we, they were used as part of any improper scheme. Every 90 or 91 days, they took this liability for a day or two and got a fat fee to do so, and they thought that was just you know, good business, didn't see it as odd. So this Revco accountant went to the board, and the house of cards started collapsing. Out of nowhere, someone made an overnight, unsecured, $400 million loan to try to bail Bennett and Revco out. Who made such a strange, out-of-the-blue loan? A bank called Bank für Arbeit und Wirtschaft und Österreichische Postkasse at Kinggesellschaft, or BAWAG for short. It turns out to be a small, union-owned commercial and agricultural bank in mm, Switzerland. <coughs> oh, Bennett was arrested, fleeing to Austria for a wine tasting. Uh, the DOJ got a wiretap on him and caught him. Benno and Maggio were arrested, criminal indictments. Revco went bankrupt. So the money's gone. The Austrians are gone. Amro's back in Panama or Switzerland or whatever. Revco is being carved up and sold off. Bawag turned out to secretly own somewhere between 10 and 37% of Revco. No one seems sure. Uh, they hit the skids. Uh, they turned out to be hiding their own billion-dollar hedge uh, losses in trading accounts and Caribbean tax havens with weak banking laws. And Revco's biggest creditor turned out to be a Moscow hedge fund. All that remains of Revco is a greasy spot, but is a, it is a special kind of greasy spot. It appears to be some lingering financial toxic waste. The U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, Michael Garcia, held a press conference where he said that Revco left behind a $430 million dollar liability of some kind. He wouldn't say what it is, but he said that it's something that floats and it's marked to market every night. Nobody in authority will say what it is. In fact, they're going to some lengths to keep that information quiet. But there are guesses going around that what that barrel of toxic waste holds is a huge number of FTDs in Sedona and other companies. FTDs that got leaked into the system by Revco that never got covered. Remember, these FTDs persist like radioactive waste. Why? Because there's some grandma who has an account at Merrill Lynch who bought Sedona, but instead got these FTDs in her brokerage account. She thinks she owns Sedona stock. Her brokerage account says she owns Sedona stock. Somebody owes her that stock. Revco's gone, and... Rhino's gone, and Amro's not to be found, and her savings are in Austria or Panama or Moscow, but Grandma still has that stock, right? Well, we don't know. But let us pretend that this guess is right, that this barrel of, tox of financial toxic waste is a glob of 400 million of unsettled FTDs in Sedona and other firms. Let's imagine the impact of what that will look like on the financial system. There are, I said, 85 million Sedona shares, but there might be 100 million of these FTDs out there. Suppose someone had to cover by buying them in. Sedona is trading at 14 cents. 100 million shares at 14 cents would be $14 million. It's nothing. But only 50,000 shares of Sedona trade a day. It would take a long time to buy in 100 million shares. The first thousand might be at 14 cents, but then next, the next thousand are going to be 20 cents, 30 cents, etc short squeeze. Supply and demand would split. There would not be what the SEC calls an orderly market. Instead, the demand line would shift so far to the right that there would be no equilibrium price anymore and the market would crack. Now, is that fanciful? Is it some skies falling fantasy? When Revco went under in October, this is what Bloomberg had to say. They spoke of the concerns that the Revco collapse <clears throat> would destabilize market. It's, here's a law professor saying that there's every sign that this is a systemic problem and Revco is one of the dots that needs to be connected. He spoke of the fears of a cascading effect that bankruptcy will trigger. Sunday Herald in Britain spoke of the gnawing fear that the Revco predicament might 
represent a sinister systemic risk. When they speak of systemic, in case you don't know, systemic means the global financial system. Systemic risk means the risk that the system will crater. That's what they're saying about Revco's collapse in Britain. Here's Dow Jones on the 17th, caught up with the U.S. Treasury Secretary Snow and Greenspan meeting with Chinese officials. While he wouldn't comment on Revco specifically, he says, many worry that the implosion of the biggest U.S. independent commodities and futures broker could trigger water fallout in financial markets. So this is Dow Jones raising that possibility. Uh, here's the Har uh, Harvard Business School insider discussing the meltdown of Revco and how strategists and portfolio managers have expected systemic event. Uh, blah, blah, systemic. Here's more from mid-October, all these within a week or two of each other. There's the Wall Street Journal discussing. No broad market risk so far. Here's what Barron's has to say on the subject. I'm not kidding you. Barron's, while the world's financial press discusses the possibility of a systemic meltdown, Barron's, which is the weekly Bible of Wall Street, doesn't mention Revco. Months go by, does not mention the Revco collapse. No mention whatsoever. A couple months went by before Barron's even mentioned in passing the collapse of Revco. That's pretty strange. And I challenge you, go to the Barron's site and find the first mention of Revco's collapse. While the world was discussing financial system meltdown, it was more than three months before Barron's gave even minimal acknowledgement. Here's something else odd about the Revco bankruptcy. The last week of 2005, in a rare move, all the court filings in the action have been sealed by the court and are not available to the public. The judge also has agreed to hold all future hearings in the case out of the public eye. The secrecy surrounding the action is unusual for a civil proceeding. In court papers, lawyers from Milbank Tweed contend the secrecy is needed to prevent irreparable harm to the creditors and third parties. So let's review Revco. It's a broker dealer that was investigated for its role in naked shorting schemes on behalf of uh, Panamanian money, CEO caught fleeing to Austria after he was caught kiting a $400 million liability uh, with the help of a New Jersey hedge fund. Um, got a late night unsecured loan from a union owned agricultural bank in Austria that turns out to actually secretly own 10 to 37 percent of Revco uh, and had its own billion dollars of losses in the Caribbean and it, uh, its biggest creditor is a Moscow hedge fund. By the way, if you ever wanted to know what business looks like when it's all mobbed up, this is it. I'm not saying that they are the mob, but it looks to me like there's a blurry line between where international <laughs> financiers stop and mob starts. Anyway, as far as the toxic waste goes, while the world press was speaking of systemic risk and Barron's, of course, ignored it all, uh, we know the investigation centered on the stock loan desk, which Santo Maggio ran before he got indicted. We know the U.S. attorney, Michael Garcia, held a press conference where he said the $430 million liability floats and is marked to market, but wouldn't say what it is. We know the judge sealed all the records. Well, what could that be? One thing it could be is a $400 million barrel of naked shorts in Sedona and other stocks, which would cost billions or tens of billions uh, and maybe crater the system if anyone had to actually clean up. Could be other things. There was talk it was related to a debt that somebody ran up in the late 1990s Asian currency crisis, but that wouldn't explain why a judge had to seal the records and that fellow came forward anyway and said that the numbers involved were far, far less than 430 million. So it's not that. A barrel of naked shorts would explain it. It's the kind of liability that persists. You can't write it off. There are people out in the world who own or think they own the stock, but in this case, the folks who owe it to them are gone. Of course, the SEC won't disclose what these FTDs are because it would reveal the trading strategies of folks like Rhino and Amro and Revco, and that would be wrong because the proprietary illegal trading strategies of Panamanian financiers and shadowy Austrian bankers could backfire on them if they starts they targeted went up and the SEC thinks it would that be wrong and unlawful. <clears throat> I may be wrong 
about Revco's barrel of financial toxic waste, but let's pretend I'm right if only to bracket the problem. If there are 100 million fails of Sedona, that's 14 million of toxic waste. So at 430 million, the Revco problem would be 30 times the Sedona problem. And that would explain why Revco's collapse made people worry about the risk of systemic failure enough to have a judge seal it. Larry Thompson says that the whole DTC problem is 6 billion, which would be 14 Revcos. And that's not counting the problem of X clearing outside the DTCC, which makes the whole thing mm, at least five times bigger. And none of this includes the Amex or the bulletin board companies or delisted companies or offshore clearing groups where I believe these FTDs are shifting, nor does it include entire classes of FTDs that enter the system in ways other than I've been describing. Um, but this would explain the SEC's odd behavior. We have come to the end of the main part of this presentation on corruption in our capital markets. I know it's been dense at times, and for this I apologize. If you're intrigued enough to want to know more, this continues with some shorter but more technical postscript thoughts. But if you've watched to this point, then you have gotten the big picture. And for your attention, I'm grateful. Thank you. Still with me, I'll give you a short mental break by talking about the term grandfathering. After the American Civil War, many Southern whites didn't want newly emancipated black people to vote. So they passed Jim Crow laws. They were poll taxes and lit literacy tests. Poll taxes simply raised the price of voting to discourage poor people from doing it. A literacy test ran something like this. You can vote if you can recite the US Constitution and Declaration of Independence from memory. So not many black people got to vote. But the law had a clause that said if your grandfather could vote, then you don't have to pass the, lit the literacy test so white people could keep voting. That's where grandfathering comes from. So my point is sometimes it's a good idea if it's, you know, passed if to, to keep people from having to rip down the fifth story of a building or something. Grandfathering makes sense. But if you're talking about a system that has a deep problem and you pass a rule to fix the problem, but then you grandfather the problem, all you've done is create the appearance of law, uh, but no actual law. And that's probably even worse. I switch now to an area of economics called public choice theory, which deals with the decision making of government agents. The Interstate Commerce Commission was the world's first regulatory body. First, they regula regulated interstate railroads, but in 1935, they expanded their mandate to include interstate trucking. As they had with railroads, they set tariffs for trucking. If you were trucking a load from Chicago to Miami, believe it or not, the ICC set the price, not the market. Now, it sounds like the USSR or Albania, but that's how it worked for 40 years. And they set trucking r rates artificially high so that everybody in the business made a ton of money, and they gave few licenses to new firms trying to get in on it. Well, why did the regulators act so as to encourage mega profits for the industry they were regulating? The answer is, regulators often get captured by those they regulate. Sometimes they just get too close uh, they spend too much time with them. That's called psychic capture. Outright bribery is a possibility. I believe that happens more than many are aware. But mainly, the ICC regulators came to know that if they were good boys and regulated lightly, uh, that after 20 years, there would be board seats at the trucking companies they had been regulating. They could retire to these seats and earn a lot of money for not doing much. So in one way or another, the trucking regulators are said to have become captured by the trucking industry. There's a special case of captured regulators called the problem of dispersed costs and concentrated benefits. I'll illustrate this with sugar, which costs 23 cents a pound at retail around the world. In the US, the price is about 43 cents a pound. And we pay an extra 20 cents a pound over world price because we have a quota that prevents American consumers from buying cheaper sugar. Uh, the average American consumes about 60 pounds of white refined sugar a year, gross, and 20 cents times 60 pounds is $12 of additional cost per consumer. It's 300 billion consumers so times $12 is an extra $3.6 billion cost to consumers. 
The quarter generates an extra 1.7 billion revenue for growers. I'd have to get into the wholesale pricing tables to show you that, so I'll skip it, but just take my word for it. Uh, $3.6 billion cost minus the $1.7 billion benefit comes to a $1.9 billion cost. There's a link at the top of the page that goes into this. Their pricing numbers are out of, are out of date. They calculate a slightly lower total cost, but then they add in a billion eight for government and words, words, words. No matter how you slice it, the quota cost about mm, creates a net $2 billion cost or so to the why retain a quota that costs the U.S. $2 billion? The answer is found in Washington, which I sh depict with a picture of Congress. But Washington's a lot more than Congress. It's departments of agriculture and K Street lobbyists and all kinds of things to show it with a picture of Congress. Whom does the quota cost? It costs 300 million people scattered around the country, $12 each. Whom does it benefit? It benefits a few dozen corporations that grow sugar. Two of them uh, get the in one state get the lion's share of the benefit. The consumers, who are it costs, are not self-aware or politically organized. Uh, they don't all go to D.C. to save themselves $12 a year. Uh, but the, the corporations are few. They are self-aware. They're organized. They lobby for their interests. They sprinkled $13 million on the halls of Congress last year, form of donations to keep things from changing. In that environment, it's natural for the political compass to deflect by creating a quota which drains 3.6 billion from unorganized consumers and delivers 1.7 billion to a few dozen organized corporations. This occurs with Democrats and Republicans. It occurs within democracies and authoritarian regimes and regulatory environments. It's just the nature of politics to create systems of dispersed cost and concentrated benefits. So please stick a pin in that and we'll come back. I'm going to talk now about the history of the SEC. I'll start by extending my apologies to people who work there. I've known many people who work in government and know that nobody goes in wanting to do a bad job. The SEC has a few thousand hardworking folks who, in most respects, do a good job, and they're operating on a tenth of the budget that I wish they had, and it must not be fun to have some jerk you never met criticizing you. On the other hand, I think there's a problem, and I don't have any way of addressing it without being critical of the SEC. So I apologize in advance for any feelings that I hurt. That's neither my style nor my intent. To understand the history of the SEC, a good place to start is by asking what was like life like before the SEC. On its 25th birthday in 1959, the SEC produced a history. It's quoted from in the paper whose link is shown. Described life before the SEC, that is before 1934, as a situation wherein no one could be sure that market prices for securities bore any reasonable relation to intrinsic values or reflected in personal supply and demand. In fact, the investigation record demonstrated that during 1929, the prices of over 100 stocks on the New York Stock Exchange were subject to manipulation by massive pool operations. Okay, that's what they say, what's a pool? In the 1920s, rich guys would pool their money together and manipulate stocks. Often they do that by running the price of the stock up, and as the public jumped into it, they would bail out and short it down. This went on regularly. In fact, the shenanigans of pools were followed in the press, looked at it as good sport. Back then, it wasn't called a hedge fund. It was called a pool. They talked about it like we now follow basketball or the NFL, or as some in the press now root on certain hedge funds. That was the 1920s. In 1929 came the crash. In 1933, the Senate formed a committee to investigate Wall Street. Uh, out of that came the Fletcher-Rayburn bill, which was 50 pages of detailed anti-manipulation statute, gave the uh, Federal Trade Commission extensive powers. It was roundly rejected by Wall Street. The president of the New York Stock Exchange, Richard Whitney, famously said to the committee, you gentlemen are making a great mistake. The exchange is a perfect institution. Now, if you've seen the movie Trading Places, you know Dick Whitney. He was an archetype of a certain class on Wall Street, blue blood, aristocrat, prep school, confidant of J.B. Morgan, a gentleman, which meant in those days, incidentally, neither Jewish nor Catholic. In his view, gentlemen didn't have to be regulated. They have a gentlemanly way of doing things. Their reputations regulate them. And here these rubes from Washington show up and want to regulate them. That's Roosevelt socialism. So Whitney fought a massive PR campaign back before there were massive PR campaigns. Roosevelt, who fought a lot of 
political battles to change America, said that a, uh, of Whitney that a more definite and highly organized drive is being made against the effective legislation for Wall Street than against any similar recommendation made by me. Will Rogers observed, those old Wall Street boys are putting up an awful fight to keep the government from putting a cop on the corner. And the final bill, the Securities Exchange Act of 34, was a flimsy compromise. So flimsy, in fact, that the chief investigator of the committee said that the law as it stands forbids and requires so little that we may truthfully say there is no body of laws as yet governing the securities market after the passage of the Act of 34. The Act created the SEC on July 1st, 1934. It gave them power to bring civil suits, but no criminal power. Any crimes had to be referred to the DOJ. At the heart of the system is the concept of a self-regulatory organization, an SRO, which works like this. An exchange sets up its regulatory body, which publishes its own regulation. It oversees itself, in a sense. The SEC approves the SRO rules, makes sure they police themselves to their rules, and knits their, them together in a national framework of rules. The New York Stock Exchange is an SRO, as is NASDAQ, whose regulatory body is the NASD. Scattered throughout the literature of the time is a phrase, restore public confidence. They took as their point the restoration of public confidence. A cynic could say they didn't seem to do as much to justify public confidence as much as they worried about restoring it. It was a PR effort. That view is uncharitable. They did do something, but it always struck me as odd uh, because it makes the SEC uh, see anything that erodes public confidence as pernicious. The 1934 Act has a rule, 17A, which reads, the United States Congress finds that the prompt and accurate clearance and settlement of securities is necessary for the protection of investors. So the US Congress says that it is a fundamental mission of the SEC to provide for the prompt and accurate clearance and settlement of securities. I'm not making that up. What became of that paragon of virtue and gentlemanly discipline, Richard Whitney? The New York Times would later report that when he stole from his customers and looted an exchange fund to aid widows and orphans, that was a New York Stock Exchange Fund, and he didn't loot it in order to aid widows and orphans. It was a fund that had been set up to aid widows and orphans, and Whitney looted it. In fact, in 1939, Whitney pled guilty to embezzlement and was given five to ten in Sing Sing. I'm not pointing fingers or gloating. I'm just pointing out uh, these facts because the line from this paragon of the Wall Street gentleman was, you know, we're gentlemen. We can be trusted. We don't do the things you think we do until he quite literally got caught stealing from widows and Pretty Kafkaesque, right? How do you explain it? Go back to the public choice explanation about sugar, but make a couple substitutions. Say, why have a rule that lets hedge funds sell stock they don't deliver, grandfathers past FTDs, lacks penalties for current misdeeds, hides information from the public, and generally picks, pins a kick me sign on the back of the capital market? Substitute the SEC for Congress. The needle deflects to favor some Wall Street banks. Tens or hundreds of billions of dollars have been drained away from retail investors to banks and hedge funds. It's just a problem of dispersed costs and concentrated benefits. Is it hundreds of billions? 
the residual value of the FTDs at just the DTCC is six billion, and including X clearing, as we saw, it must be five times that, so 30 billion. But who knows what they were before they got shorted? 100 billion, 200 billion? This doesn't include companies that have been bankrupted or simply delisted. Some economists, like Shapiro, believe that hundreds, if not several thousand companies and have been wiped out along with hundreds of billions of dollars, if not perhaps a couple trillion. Is money really shared back to the SEC in the form of bribes? I doubt it, but there are people leaving the SEC in droves. One fellow was head of market regulation and just took a $4 million job at a Wall Street law firm. Three years ago, about four people let per year left the SEC from levels that required a press release. In 2005, 19 people left. Is that because they can get $4 million salaries or because they see a train wreck coming? I don't know. But one explanation for what's going on is that the SEC is a captured regulator and specifically that this is a problem of distributed costs, concentrated benefits, and that this flimsy regulatory regime allows massive FTDs to drain money from the American retail investor, channel it to Wall Street, and that's where the regulators go to work when they leave. I hate to be critical, but how well is the SEC doing its job? Remember the 17A mandate. How have they done with that prompt clearing and settlement of trades mandate? Uh, the scandals of the last few years have resulted in a system where the SEC is asking companies to be far more transparent, and I celebrate that. How is the SEC doing at transparency? How are they doing with restoring public confidence? Are you, are you confident? I'm confident. There are three explanations for what's going on. The first is that the SEC was just set up to be feeble. It's underfunded. It lacks criminal powers. It can take on the occasional social menace like Martha Stewart, but not a couple dozen hedge funds running trillions of dollars. It was set up to assuage public concern, but not really address it. The second explanation is the problem of dispersed costs and concentrated benefits. The feebleness of the regulatory regime imposes costs on Americans who save and it provides a benefit to people who live in Manhattan. The third explanation is the one I proposed earlier, that is fear of systemic failure. They understand that if they wake up tomorrow and decide to force the large pre-existing open positions at the DTCC and the X-clearing system to be bought in, the volatility would vapor lock the system. Uh, the financial press, expect nothing from them. Uh, my experience of reporters has actually been generally positive. Most, especially local reporters, tend to be honest and seem to want to honestly get their head around stories and understand them and do a good job. And the financial press outside of Wall Street, the, the Financial Times and the Investor's Business Daily, somehow, you know, they seem good and honest, but the Wall Street financial press can just totally be written off. They're like the pre-Watergate Washington, D.C. press corps who had gotten so chummy with the White House that you know, they overlooked all kinds of things going on, didn't write about it until these two young guys, Woodward and Bernstein, showed up and they weren't bought into the system, so they blew the lid off things. The, the, the Wall Street press corps is a non-event. It's just they've become the, the pawns of powerful hedge funds, and, and you can assume you can ignore them for this scandal. This may be a perfect crime. The crime's extensive, yet victims don't know they're being victimized often, and even if they figure it out, it's difficult to explain. Few will believe them. Wall Street has an interest in downplaying it. Their mouthpiece, the Wall Street Press, will just trumpet a party line that says you should focus on your business. If you only ran a better liquor store, no, maybe no one would rob it, which is, of course, a non sequitur, but they parrot it endlessly. The cop on the beat would grandfather past crime, downplay current crime, and refuse disclosing information. So this could be the perfect crime. If you get into this issue, you're going to wrestle with pigs, so you should anticipate their arguments. They're going to tell you that these are crummy companies that the comp public should not invest in anyway. To that, just say, of course, fine, let's have a list of companies that don't get legal protection. Oh, wait, we already do. It's called the break show threshold list. Or they say, uh, these crummy companies should just focus on their business and not their stock. The answer to that is, what part of illegal don't you understand? You can counter with questions of your own. You'll only get slop in return, but you can might as well ask, should the SEC permit illegal failures? And if not, why they grandfather them? And why can't they force settlement? Why won't they disclose the FTDs every night? Somebody has to know how many there are. And if it's such a 
uh, you know, for them to be on the reg show threshold list, if it's such a so fanciful to think this is a big problem, just disclose the size of the failures by a company. Ask how can investors know whether they're buying real shares or just getting some hedge funds IOUs when they buy in the market. And in every recent Wall Street scandal, the tenacity of the state regulators embarrassed the SEC. The analyst payola scandal, the mutual fund late trading scandal. It's, is it going to happen again here? My guess is yes. There are a few things you can do to help. First, remember the mantra, settle the trades and disclose the fails. Second, stay informed at the sanity check, which is a central station for this issue. New FOIA requests get deposited there and good blogs and articles. Third, spread the word. There have been over 150,000 downloads of this presentation already. If you enjoyed it, send it out to a few friends. Send links and letters to the press. Don't bother with the Wall Street press. They're not going to do anything, obviously. It's not going to be broken there. Uh, it's going to be broken in Chicago or Seattle or Kansas City or somewhere. Write the regulators. At the Senate check, you can get the email addresses of the SEC commissioners. Hit them with letters. Um, lastly, politicians. There's a link here to congressmerge.com. It's a great site. It lets you uh, drop letters very quickly to your representatives and senators. It doesn't even cost a stamp. Uh, I'll mention that politicians are most concerned about jobs. So point out to them the cost of this problem, not just for small entrepreneurial companies, but for folks like Delta and General Motors. They are under this kind of attack. They will go under. Their pension li liabilities are going to shift to American taxpayers if we don't do something. Who knows if they would make it or not if their stock were not being counterfeited. So contact politicians. In my view, they're going to get this before the regulators get it, and the SEC is going to be embarrassed when Congress and some other folks in D.C. move first. question always to ask is, why is the SEC grandfathering and hiding the FTDs? Why do they fear volatility from large pre-existing open positions? And how long will they dither as thousands of companies are harmed and countless American jobs are lost?